Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about cellular respiration. Sometimes students confuse respiration, breathing, just breathing in, and cellular respiration, and they are linked. Cellular respiration, however, is going to take place at the level of the cell, more specifically inside the mitochondria, um, and so we need oxygen for that. But it's basically taking our food and then breaking it down in the presence of oxygen to make ATP out of it. What if you're a bacteria? Can you do respiration? You sure can. You don't need a mitochondria to do respiration. They can actually use their outer membranes to do uh, aerobic respiration. And so basically, if you are a track athlete, so this is Usain Bolt right here, when you run, you're using respiration to make energy in the form of ATP and allow your muscles to move. And so this is a quick little study I did. I took all of the world records currently right now from the 100 to the 10,000. And so this is uh, Bikili is the guy who owns the 10,000 meter record. And what I did is I figured out their pace. In other words, how fast they're running. This would be in meters per second for the 100, the 200, all the way down to the 10,000 meter run, which is a little over six miles. And what you can see in this graph is that the pace is quickly going to drop off and then it's pretty much going to stabilize and if we were to go out to the marathon or continue basically we're pretty effective at, r at running at a specific pace but we die really quickly when we're sprinting and so a way to think about that is the two things we're going to talk about in this podcast is we're going to talk about aerobic respiration so aerobic respiration is going to be respiration in the presence of oxygen but we also have almost like a turbo button that is anaerobic respiration and so if we really need to go fast we can get that extra speed that we have up here um, by doing our anaerobic respiration. The problem if you've ever run is that when you get out to this 400 meter you get a buildup of uh, lactic acid and it's incredibly painful and so you can't keep that pace going. Example of a, a lab I did in class was, and it's weird how this exactly mirrors it, what we did was the muscle fatigue lab. So basically you had a tennis ball and in one hand you had to squeeze it as many times as you could in 10 seconds and then do another 10 seconds and do another 10 seconds and this is the class average. So the class average was it looks like around 25 times times in 10 seconds but you can see that it quickly drops off and then it kind of levels off and so the same thing this would be that aerobic respiration and then this is going to be that anaerobic respiration and it was fun to see the students faces because as they start to go anaerobic your arm just starts to build up if you have lactic acid on the inside of it. But before we get there, let's talk about respiration and what it's for. It's for heterotrophs. So we're heterotrophs and basically what we're doing is we're taking organic compounds in the presence of oxygen and we're converting that to carbon dioxide and water. What else are we generating? ATP. Now what kind of things are doing this? Animals, fungi, bacteria are all heterotrophs and they're using the organic material to actually make energy. It, luckily we have autotrophs like plants and algae and basically what they're doing is they're converting that carbon dioxide and water back into organic materials. The only thing that's a little deceptive is that plants are also going to break down those organic compounds and so they do cellular respiration as well. And so everything's doing cellular respiration. It's how we get energy out of our food. Okay, here's our equation and again if you know what photosynthesis is, this is simply the opposite. We're going to take glucose in the presence of oxygen. So here's glucose and here's O2 and then we're going to break that into carbon dioxide water and then we're going to generate a little bit of ATP. Now where is the energy sit? The energy sits right here in this hydrogen on the outside of that glucose and watch what happens to that hydrogen. It's going to fall down and it's going to grab onto the oxygen because oxygen wants electrons and so that's where the energy is coming from. And What the energy is used to do is it's used to make ATP and ATP is that little fuel that we use in all of our cells. Uh, this slide is funny but it's, it's saying this, behold the power of oxygen. So this fire comes from oxygen pulling electrons close to it. And so there's a huge amount of energy found inside that pull of electrons towards oxygen. Now if we were to do this inside our body we could get a lot of energy out of our food but we would also burst into flames and so we do it in a really controlled process. Just like when we learned photosynthesis and we had to learn the parts of the uh, chloroplast, when you're learning the uh, cellular respiration you have to learn a few parts of the mitochondria. So first of all we have these folds on the inside of the mitochondria. Those are called the cristae and basically what we have is two membranes. We're going to have an inner membrane right here and then we're going to have an outer membrane right here and then this space in the middle is called the inner membrane space 
And on the inside, mitochondria, we think, used to be bacteria of their own. And so they'll reproduce through binary fission. They have their own DNA. They have their ribosomes. But they are kind of almost living inside us, uh, not as a parasite, but as a symbiont. They're actually helping us as, as we generate energy. So there are three steps in cellular respiration. Let's start with the first one. So the first one is going to be glycolysis. The second one, normally, we think of as the Krebs cycle. And then the third one is going to be the electron transport chain. And so the first one, I love this diagram here because it's putting glycolysis outside the mitochondria. And so this is going to take place outside the mitochondria. Where would that be? Well, that would be in the cytoplasm of a cell inside your body, or it would be right outside of bacteria. But what happens in glycolysis? Basically, we're taking glucose. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. And in glycolysis, we're going to break that down into two molecules of pyruvate. Each of those have three carbons inside it. So the two three carbon molecule, that's what glycolysis does. What do we generate in there? Well, we generate a little bit of ATP. For one glucose molecule in glycolysis, we're going to make two ATP. The other thing that we make is a chemical called NAD. What we're basically doing is we're transferring high energy electrons to NAD, and we're adding protons to it as well. And we'll get to NAD in just a little bit. Let's follow pyruvate then. Pyruvate is going to diffuse into the mitochondria, and then we're going to have this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to convert that three carbon molecule into acetyl CoA. This is coenzyme A. So basically now we have a two carbon molecule. That is going to go into the Krebs cycle. Now, since we're going from a three carbon pyruvate to a two carbon acetyl CoA, we're giving off carbon. And that carbon is going to be given off in the form of carbon dioxide. And so when you breathe out, a third of that carbon coming out of you is going to come right here from this complex inside the, uh, inside the matrix, we call this. I should have said that before. This is the matrix on the inside of the mitochondria. OK, let's keep watching acetyl CoA. So it's a two carbon molecule. Where does it go next? It goes to the Krebs cycle. And so in the Krebs cycle, we're going to break it down further. And we're going to get rid of these two uh, carbons in acetyl CoA. And we're going to give those off as carbon dioxide. So we're getting rid of carbon dioxide. What else are we producing in the Krebs cycle? You can see here that we're producing a little bit of ATP, two ATP. But we're also adding energy, again, to NAD. And we're adding energy to its friend. We'll call this FAD. And so what do NAD and FAD have? They have these high energy electrons. And they're going to carry those electrons to the third step, which is the electron transport chain. OK, let's get to the electron transport chain then. All of our energy, pretty much, that was in glucose is now in NAD and FAD. So they're going to transfer their electrons. And those electrons are going to go through what's called an electron transport chain. Basically, they're moving through a series of proteins. And the energy of those proteins is used to pump protons. Protons are going to be hydrogen ions to the outside of this inner membrane into what's called the inner membrane space. So now we've built up all of these protons right here. What happens to the electron? The electron is going to be added to other protons and oxygen that we breathe in. And that's going to make our byproduct, which is going to be water. And so let's slow that, just, slow that for just a second. The oxygen that you breathe is moving in here. And it's going to be that last electron acceptor right in here in the matrix. And we're going to take the protons. What happened to those protons? They'll actually flow through a protein called ATP synthase. Those protons will combine with the electrons and the oxygen. And it's going to make water, which is going to be a byproduct of that. Now, how much ATP do we make down here? Well, we can make around 32 or 34 ATP in this last step. And so in the electron transport chain, we're making a whole heck of a lot of energy. And so it's worth taking a look at how that actually works. So let's Let's go to the electron transport chain. So kind of to situate ourselves, what do we have? Well, we have NAD, our friends NAD and FAD. What are NAD and FAD passing off? They're electrons. Those electrons are going to move through the electron transport chain like this. Every time they go through one of these proteins, it's going to pump another proton ion out. Because that's the other thing that NAD and FAD are bringing. They're bringing these hydrogen ions. So we're going to pump these ions out here. And pretty soon, what you get is a, is a heck of a lot of positive charge out here in this inner membrane space. There's no place for it to go. In other words, every NAD that we drop off, we're going to move these electrons down. 
and then we're going to generate a whole heck of a lot of positive charge in this inner membrane space. Now if you look right here, fat is actually dropping its electron a little bit farther down, so it can't generate as much, but we're pushing out either three protons or two protons, depending on if it's NAD or fat. Okay, what happens to all of these protons out here? They can't go anywhere. They go, can't go outside the mitochondria, they can't come inside the matrix, but they can move through this. This is called ATP synthase, that's the name of this proton right, or protein right here. And basically this is the site of ATP synthesis. And so basically as every proton flows through it, every proton that comes through we're going to generate ATP. And it almost works like a little rotor that every time a proton goes through it switches it and it attaches that phosphate onto ADP to make ATP. And that's why in the electron transport chain we can make all of that ATP. There's nothing special about it, it's just that we're storing all that energy and instead of releasing it in a ball of fire, we're releasing it in little bits to make a heck of a lot of HTP or ATP. Okay, so there's a problem. What happens if you don't have oxygen pulling that electron the whole way, or let's say you don't have mitochondria present. Well then you have a problem, and the problem is this. It's okay to take glucose during glycolysis and break it into two pyruvates, because you're going to make a little bit of ATP, but the problem is that you are ha you're adding those electrons to NAD, and so basically what's happening is that we're adding electrons to NADP, NAD plus and we're transferring it to NADH and so pretty much what happens is there's no more of this and so glycolysis has to shut down even though we can make a little bit of ATP uh, with, with each breakdown of glucose eventually there's no NADP plus and so the whole process has to stop and so Nature, of course, has a solution to this, and the first one is called lactic acid fermentation. This takes place in your muscles, especially when your muscles are under a huge amount of stress, like if you're sprinting or if you're holding your breath for a long period of time. And so basically what's going on, again, there's no oxygen, there's no mitochondria, so let's look what happens. Basically, your cells are taking glucose in glycolysis and breaking it down into two pyruvate molecules. So we were stuck here, remember, with the NADH, but then there's a further conversion. Basically what you're doing is you're converting that pyruvate down into lactate or lactic acid. The nice thing about that is it's accepting these electrons so we can make more of this NADP, uh, excuse me, NAD plus and then this can be recycled again. And so basically what happens is that you can have this process occurring with glucose you know over and over and over and over and over again and every time you do that over and over and over and over again basically you're making two ATP each time. And so if you've ever done sprinting when you're sprinting, you're getting aerobic respiration, but you're also doing anaerobic respiration on top of that. The problem with that is you're going to build up lactate in your muscles, and that lactate is like a toxin. You're going to have to break it down, and that takes oxygen. And so if you've ever watched a sprinter, especially somebody who's run like the 400 meter dash, when they're done and they're interviewing them, they're, they have a hard time doing an interview because they have to keep breathing to take in more O2 and eventually get rid of that lactate. And so lactic acid fermentation is going to take place in some bacteria and in muscle cells. But we have another solution to this in bacteria, anaerobic problem of stopping right here with this full NADH, and that's called alcoholic fermentation. Alcoholic fermentation works the same way. Basically we break it down into pyruvate and then we break that further down into a chemical called ethyl alcohol or ethanol. It's, don or it's accepting these electrons so it can recycle this NADP plus again. The only difference here is that when we made lactate that was a, two, a three carbon molecule. When we do alcoholic fermentation what we're making is carbon dioxide and we're giving that off. And so if you were to take yeast and put them in a bottle with a bunch of fruit juice, basically what they'll do is they'll use up all the oxygen, then they'll switch to alcoholic fermentation. What are they going to build up? They're going to build up ethyl alcohol. That's simply how we make wine. And there's also going to build up carbon dioxide, which we could let go. Or if we're making beer, that's the carbon carbonation that we're going to find in beer. And so again, cellular respiration is just a quick way to get energy out of glucose. We use glucose as an example, but we can do cellular respiration on pretty much any type of food. And it's a way that we get energy. And we're doing it, bacteria are doing it, plants are doing it, and I hope that's helpful.